today we're talking about just a crazy Supreme Court decision that was completely overshadowed last week by Democratic candidates coming together for the first time to not answer questions in 30 second speeches. Also, it's not a great sign when I had an easier time understanding candidates speaking Spanish than Marion Williams. Well, on June 27th, the Supreme Court released their decision in the combined cases of Rutch v Common Cause and Lamone v Bensick. Have fun remembering those case names for more than 30 seconds. These cases went over partisan gerrymandering, and the Supreme Court finally gave us a definitive ruling on the issue. Spoiler alert for, well, a news story. If you like your vote mattering, well, then you're not gonna like this outcome. The Supreme Court on Thursday ruled that federal courts are powerless to hear challenges to partisan gerrymandering. Whoa, leave it to the one branch of government that doesn't have to get elected to mess up voting for the rest of us. Today I just want to go over the Supreme Court's published decision and first clarify that statement a little, because while just reading you that sentence could whip up a Twitter frenzy, the reality is a little less scary. Second, I want to go over the arguments that both sides made, because if you're anything like me, you're probably pretty curious about what legal gymnastics led us to the decision that federal courts are powerless to hear partisan gerrymandering challenges. First though, what? The court's conservative majority ruled against intervening in questions of partisan gerrymandering. So they said electoral maps are not reviewable by federal courts, dismissing challenges by Democrats in North Carolina and Republicans in Maryland. Ironically, here the judges were split on party lines. Now I want to clarify something. You hear everybody saying partisan gerrymandering in the reporting of this case. Not because, well, it's a pretty short story and I have to fill three more minutes. Let's just pack in as many words as possible. But instead, because while today's ruling says that partisan gerrymandering challenges cannot be heard in a federal court, challenges of racial gerrymandering can still be heard there. Now that might sound like an odd line to draw. Whoa, we're not diluting their vote because they're black. That's racist. No, we're doing it because they overwhelmingly vote Democratic. <laughs> Sorry for the confusion, folks. So before we get into the internal logic of blocking federal courts from hearing cases of partisan gerrymandering, why are we distinguishing between racial gerrymandering and partisan gerrymandering? For this next part, I'm going to be reading from the official Supreme Court's decision, written by the Chief Justice and Jock of the Supreme Court, Honorable John Roberts. He writes, in two areas, one person one vote, and racial gerrymandering, this court has held that there is a role for the courts with respect to at least some issues that could arise from a state's drawing of congressional districts. Now that might sound super arbitrary, and I'm hoping I'm not triggering a White Votes Matter 2 campaign by making this video, but let's get into it, because understanding the difference between being a racist and a partisan is kinda key to understanding this decision. The Supreme Court often looks at maps to see whether or not they've been drawn to hurt minority groups. but. It's been reluctant to, to make those same kind of decisions about partisan gerrymandering, where you have to decide between Republicans and Democrats. The main reason for this is because, while the framers couldn't imagine a world where African Americans would ever be able to vote, the two prominent political parties of the time, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, bet they had some trouble compromising, rigging districts against each other was a pretty clear threat at the time. As the decision says, partisan gerrymandering was known in the colonies prior to independence, and the framers were familiar with it at the time of the drafting and ratification of the Constitution. They addressed the election of representatives to Congress in the Elections Clause, assigning to state legislatures the power to prescribe the times, places, and manners of holding elections for members of Congress, while giving Congress the power to make or alter any such regulations. So the responsibility of throwing out partisan maps really is up to the elected officials in state legislatures and Congress. If you're thinking, well that doesn't seem right, <laughs> I'm sure there's some wiggle room for interpretation. Well, this is one of those sections that the Constitution itself was very clear on. Article 1 
That's right, this got top billing. Section 4 says the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations, except as to the place of choosing senators. There is a little wiggle room there though, because, and this is true, the founders misspelled the word choose in the final document. Hey John Adams, you miswrote this. That's fine, no one's going to read it that carefully. Everything I've laid out so far has only circled the answer to the question of the difference between the types of gerrymandering. Now it's time to dive right in. There's one reason that makes it easier to prosecute racial gerrymandering than partisan gerrymandering, and that is the constitutional section I quoted earlier. It said that Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations, and well. Many of the issues of civil rights are very complex and most difficult, but about this there sh can and should be no argument. Every American citizen must have an equal right to vote. And with that, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act, which prohibits any state practice that results in members of a racial or language minority having less opportunity than other members of the electorate to participate in the political process and to elect representatives of their choice. Because of this, racial gerrymandering is illegal while partisan gerrymandering is just a frowned upon totally legal strategy. This is where things get complicated, because as the Chief Justice points out, partisan gerrymandering claims have proved far more difficult to adjudicate, in part because a jurisdiction may engage in constitutional political gerrymandering. The central problem is determining when political gerrymandering has gone too far. Is it when your districts look like they were created by Salvador Dali, or when it's something more measurable, like these two cases that inspired this decision? First in North Carolina, Republicans have controlled nearly all of the state's 13 congressional districts since 2012, even though they've consistently won only about half of the statewide congressional votes. Or because no party's hands are clean on this one, Maryland. Democrats redrew one of the state's congressional districts in 2011, flipping it from a Republican one to a Democratic one. Roscoe Bartlett, who represented the district, won over 60% of the votes in 2020. In 2012, with the new district lines in place, he lost to a Democrat by more than 20 percentage points. Democrats have held a 7 to 1 edge in that state's congressional delegation ever since. Hey, maybe this could all cancel itself out. So this all feels like some shade of illegal. Touch of partisan gerrymandering is totally fine though. So where do you draw the line? Pun intended. Basically the court says that this is a political question, that it's impossible to know where to draw the line because state legislatures in, invariably, whoever's in control of the majority party in the legislature is responsible for drawing the political boundaries. How do you know when that essentially political process crosses a constitutional line? What the Supreme Court's majority here says is that is not a, a, a task for the courts. Now I know there are gerrymandering tests out there that quite a few people think work, such as the voting efficiency gap that measures wasted votes in elections to see how many people aren't being represented. But well, that doesn't really matter much anymore. As the Supreme Court officially said, stop bringing us these ugly districts you drew. We're not going to put them on the fridge or even acknowledge them. The Constitution does not require proportional representation and the federal courts are neither equipped nor authorized to appropriate political power as a matter of fairness. It's not even clear what fairness looks like in this context. Yeah, sounds like he's vetting a little bit there. Instead, if you think your district is gerrymandered in a partisan way, you can either A, take it up with your state's legislature, you know, the guys who did the redistricting. I'm sure they'd be more than receptive to you pointing out their mistakes. Or B, take it up with Congress so we can have better laws governing what partisan gerrymandering is. Well, you can turn off the episode now with a pretty solid understanding of everything that just happened 
there might be one final lingering question in your mind. What about one person, one vote? This is clearly voter dilution. Well, that context came from the case of Baker v. Carr, which looked at... In one county, 10,000 people had one representative, and in another, 2 million people also had only one representative? That's like giving everyone in Greenlee County 200 times as many votes as someone in Phoenix. The idea here is one of a person's vote should be roughly equal to another person's vote in their respective states. You might be hearing that and thinking to yourselves, well, checkmate. Clearly the Supreme Court decision is wrong. Someone should really tell the Chief Justice about this basic legal concept. But of course it was in the back of his mind when he was writing this decision. If you want to learn more about why one person one vote should apply to partisan gerrymandering, well, read the losing opinion. With what time I have left though, I need to explain why it doesn't. Because that's a lot less obvious than the opinion that won the argument. The Supreme Court case of Reynolds v. Sims was the main influence on what we think of as one person one vote, and said that each state needs to create legislative voting districts with relatively equal population sizes. That makes sense. You can't say, alright, we're going to split Texas into two voting districts. The first one is going to be Beto O'Rourke's house, and the second one, the rest of Texas. I wonder which party he's going to vote for this year. So why don't these population regulations apply to partisan gerrymandering? Well, as the decision says, vote dilution is the one person one vote cases refers to the idea that each vote must carry equal weight. That requirement does not extend to political parties. It does not mean each party must be influential in proportion to the number of its supporters. So there you have it, the Supreme Court has finally spoken out on the issue of partisan gerrymandering, and it definitively said, we're not going to speak out on the issue of partisan gerrymandering. So stop bringing us these cockamamie maps. Take it up with state legislatures or Congress. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. I can't believe I forgot to write this in the script, but also, happy 4th of July. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the legal arguments of today, remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the left of my head. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.